Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a campaign agency that specialises in community organising. We only work with people that want to build power to make the world a better place, including community-based organisations, trade unions, progressive businesses and social democratic parties across the globe. We develop community engagement strategies to win campaigns both big and small. We train engagement staff and volunteers in the Marshall Gantz framework of leadership, organizing and action. And we help folks craft their story through the practice of public narrative that connects people through shared values and moves them to act together. And if you want to create change in your community, then hit us up at dunstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers as Australia's number one plan of law firm. Morris Blackburn believe the law should serve everyone, not just those who can afford it. Morris Blackburn have helped influence some of Australia's most important legal decisions, including equal pay for women and Indigenous workers, and helped over 500,000 Australians get the compensation they deserve. Morris Blackburn Lawyers, experience you can count on. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that's out every Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And this is our part two of our budget week um, series. Uh, we're going to be unpacking the budget, the federal budget that was handed down by Treasurer Jim Chalmers on Tuesday night. And I'm going to be joined by per capita's Emma Dawson and the McCall Institute's Ed Kavanagh to unpack what was in the budget, the winners and losers, the movers and shakers, um, and um, what this means in terms of the economy going forward, but also what this means in terms of uh, the election and Labor's fortunes at the next uh, general election. So check out today's episode. Don't for, don't for, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And when you're done listening to the show, please give us five stars uh, and uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcast or, or whatever pod app you listen to that enables you to do that. And we'll be announcing our uh, socially democratic Patreon uh, page very very soon. So look out for links uh, for that and for everything else. Make sure you follow Dunn Street on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. All right, let's get to today's episode. We are taping this one on a Thursday afternoon on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Uh, And on Tuesday night, uh, a budget was handed down by... Uh, Treasurer Jim Chalmers. And uh, if you're like me and watched uh, game four of the Eastern Conference uh, semifinals between the Boston Celtics and the Cleveland Cavaliers, you wouldn't have seen what happened in the budget. So like me, I've invited two guests on today to uh, wrap it up for us and give us all of the inside movements of what happened in this budget. And I guess uh, what were the, the pluses and what were the challenges and what it means in terms of the election and all these other things as well. Um, and I'm joined on the line once again by the Executive Director of Per Capita Australia, Emma Dawson. Welcome back to Social Democratic. Thank you. And Ed Kavanagh, the CEO of the McCall Institute. Uh, welcome back to Social Democratic. Good to be back. Excellent. Less jet lag this time, Ed, than Absolutely, the last time yeah. we spoke. Good man. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully slightly more coherent. We'll see how we go. Excellent. Excellent. No, no, you did a great job. Um, before we talk about the budget, I just want to get a sense from you guys in your both respective roles as working for uh, uh, progressive uh, think tanks. Uh, you know, how do you spend budget week? What are the things that are on your mind? What what stresses you out? Uh, you know, like is I'm assuming this is like your grand final uh, for the year, and so therefore you're super excited, but also that comes with a lot of challenges along the way. Emma, to you first, like, you know, do you have like a sort of a comfy blanket that you sit underneath when you watch the budget or do you make it like you've got a repertoire like a cup of tea or you know tell the kids get out of here like what happens in budget week how do you sort of get ready and prepped and Ugh. absorb this information um well it, it I, I don't want to whinge too much because you know i've actually done budget week as a staffer i did that five times and that's that's when it's exhausting um but 
no, I, I have to watch in my bedroom so I can get some quiet and uh, and make sure that the kids in the other room. Um, it, it budget week is is still a killer. Like I said to my team yesterday, is it only Wednesday? Like it feels like Friday. Friday. It's it's a long week. By the time the budget rolls around, you've usually you know you've you've been hard at it since at least uh, Sunday when the the real leaks start coming that weekend before you know so. Um, and then yeah, it's it's I, I tend to watch it with a glass of wine. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not a not a big okay. at home drinker, but budget night I make an exception early in the week. Um, and yeah, it's it is. I mean, it's it's interesting because it is it's a roadmap, right? It, we don't we don't do the sort of state of the union thing in this country like they do in the states. The budget is the big statement about where a government's going and what they think is important and and the priorities they have to choose. Um, and in a time like this, the last couple of budgets not only have been more interesting because it's a Labor government um, and I, I, I tend to agree with them more on things than I do the other mob and they also tend to do things rather than just undo things and settle, keep things quiet. Um, but it's also been an incredibly challenging time in the economy, right? We've, had, we've been in an inflation crisis. We've had a couple of surpluses for the first time in 15 years um, and we're at a point where we're really at a, at a, at a you know, inflection point in the economy where we have to change our economic base. So it's been particularly interesting. Yeah, I love it. Ed, to you. Oh, thank you, Emma. Um, I would have a follow-up question. Did you go with a Shiraz or a Pinot? But we could talk about that later. Um, Ed, to you. Now, obviously, you're based in Adelaide. So this podcast, sorry, this uh, budget would have been six hours on delay. That would have been a challenge for you. I'm sure you're texting other people to find out, you know, what's happening right now because I'm on no, delay. Exactly. No, it was, it, was a, it was a nice budget night. I wasn't in Canberra this year. I um, it was with my old man at his place. He's been, you know, he's a sort of diehard Labor guy his whole life. You know, been watching these every, every year since Whitlam. Um, so that's always, always really good fun. But, yeah, it, it's... As Emma was saying, you know, this is kind of the it's a marker on the uh, on the whole cycle. It's it, a lot of the work that we do over the previous few months or years. You know, you try and this is kind of a, a bit of a line in the sand and a bit of a reset in some ways. And you get a sense of like what the where the government's going, where some of the work that we're doing is is going to be relevant in the future, all that sort of stuff. On the night itself, you know, I'm usually one of those people that's got the holding screen up waiting for you know at 7 29 or whatever it is you know waiting for all the stuff to kick in so you can download it and get a sense of um actually you know get into the weeds of the the budget documents but beforehand i mean there's a bit of preparation to do for the for the days that come after i guess but it also feels a little bit like christmas eve or something where you're just kind of you're just kind of waiting you've sort of done all your work or, or maybe like an election day you know where you've kind of everything's sort of out there and you're just you're just kind of waiting and to to see the results roll in there's not really that much more you can do but um, I always kind of enjoy budget night. I think it's, um, uh, you know, as Emma was saying, it, there's a bit of theatre to it. Um, and, yeah, you get a sense of, of where the government's heading in this very critical uh, critical period. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a bit of a calmer one for me, just having a beer with my dad. But <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> and how nice is it to have Labor hand down a budget as opposed to uh, the dirty Tories as well? That's something that is a privilege and we shouldn't take for granted. Well, I, and should just say, adding to it. I should say too, I mean, we're at least back in the lockup, right? We were, we were booted out of the lockup <laughs> under Morrison um, per capita. So yeah. at least we're able, I mean, I didn't go, obviously. I was at home with my glass of wine, but um, Margaret McKenzie on our team was able to go up and it makes a difference. It, it's important to be able to get in there and not just to, get an early look at the the papers themselves but because you're in that room with other people and you who are, who are often pe- people that are interested in the same things you are um so yeah it's, it's a much more uh, inclusive budget lockup than it used to be i would say ed you had a thought there as well sorry i interrupted you yeah i was just saying like you know as emma was saying when labor governments do this particularly at such an important juncture in the really history of the country and the economic moment we're in and the geopolitical dynamic we're in, all this sort of stuff, there's a lot to search for. There's a lot to look for. And it's not just the dollars and cents. Like often when you're hearing, you know, I was listening to hack and stuff and they're talking about, oh, it's so boring, like blah, blah, blah. There's, you know, all these numbers and, and everything. A lot of it is about how they frame issues and how they're talking about issues and these sort of statements of intent over the medium term. And I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff in this budget that, that speaks to that as well. And that's very a very labour forward-looking, um, I guess, aspect to this. Nice segue. 
to then let's talk about what uh, – let's give the, our listeners the top line about what is in this budget. Now, we initially were going to call this the winners and the losers, but we've changed our two topics to we're happy about this. And the second one would be we think there's more work to be done in this particular area. And uh, I think, uh, Emma, you've got the long straw on this one uh, in that we're getting you to re- tell us what we're happy about in this particular budget. So what are you happy about in this particular budget? I'm happy about the uh, the the very clear signal that it sends that this government is not going to be spooked out of intervening in the economy. Um, uh, the Future Made in Australia um, policy and the various... Um, investment vehicles, um, subsidies, incentives that that includes for us to create a more diversified industrial base uh, that relies on renewables and not fossil fuels and importantly that puts working people and the benefits for them, um, the opportunities for the country at, at its heart is actually a huge shift as you would, I think we said this last week, as you'd noticed by you know the, the hysterical reaction of the Fin Review and oh, some of them and, and some in the Oz as well. Um, they're not they're not resiling from this this reconstruction agenda this um, this is what labor governments do right they come in at a time of crisis uh, they come in when things have been run down into the ground and they fix them but uh, this is bigger than that this is about what ne- what our economy is going to look like in the future um, it's embracing the challenges of tomorrow um, it's you know it, um, responding directly to Biden's in, um, inflation reduction act to a lot of the things that are happening in Europe and um, positioning Australia to offer young people a genuine future, you know, um, a future made in Australia. It sounds, you know, I don't want to repeat the marketing lines, but it's actually important, you know. Um, I don't think it is as Bernard Keane in Crikey, who I, you know, generally regard pretty well, but he he accused Albanese of, of pandering to the victimhood of blue-collar workers in WA in Queensland. I think that's an incredibly cynical read. You know, I think there is absolutely a role for government in ensuring that there is a functioning distributive economy that provides people with the opportunity to build a good life based on good jobs that are sustainable, that pay well, um, and that bring us greater economic prosperity in the future. That's a role of government. The, the argument that that is somehow just picking winners and doomed to fail and, oh, taxpayer money could go to a company that doesn't last more than 10 years, whoop de doo You know, we do that all the time. The, 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 the level of fossil fuel subsidies in this, in this budget remain high because they're in place and they've been there for, for decades and they're very, very difficult to undo. To suggest that we shouldn't take an active role in the new economy is nonsense. So that's the thing that is at the heart of this budget. I think a lot of true believers go, well, where's the vision? You know, where's the rhetoric? There was, There's plenty of rhetoric, but the, importantly for me, there's plenty of detail and there's plenty of ambition in there and it's a good thing. So, and we'll get into some of that detail as well. So obviously you like the renewable stuff. There was stuff around housing, students, yep. health. Yep. Pay parental leave, yep. cost of living, all of that. Right, care economy stuff very important to me, obviously as well. The housing stuff really important. We'll get onto all of that in detail, but this is a this is a positive, laborist vision for the country, mm. and it's not just vote for us because we're not the other guys. It's they're offering something that people can get on board with. Wonderful, Ed. Yeah, the short straw. Yeah, or do you want to jump on some of the things you liked about the budget first before I get you to do the yeah. other part? <laughs> Yeah, look, I think um, what's what's sort of interesting about this is uh, I kind of wind back a little bit. Maybe if you go back to the first year of the government, it felt like this sort of masterclass in message discipline and narrative and all this sort of stuff. And it did feel towards the end of last year that the story of what the government was about was sort of a bit adrift. I think there was a kind of like growing concern a little bit about that they were losing control of the narrative of the story about the purpose of really where they were going and for the first time in a while I think this budget tells that story and it creates the sort of framework really for going into an election yes but also what the purpose of the the Albanese government is and you know this is as I was saying budgets are just so complicated there's so much to do you know I, I don't pretend to know every nook and cranny of it two days after it's been released but the ability to kind of consolidate this entire agenda into really five key value points, which is what they've done. You know, there's cost of living pressures they're addressing, building more homes, investing in a future made in Australia, the Medicare and care economy, and then 
um, you know, this sort of uh, area around advancing opportunity and equality. These are kind of bigger themes and they tell a really powerful story. And I think that's, um, that's something for people to be able to really understand and grapple with. So that's what I, I like about it at a very high level before we even get into any of the, the, the details. Yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it? It's uh, message discipline is so important uh, in any part of uh, political campaigning, but it mm-hmm. seems like they might be shaping uh, some kind of grid, perhaps one could say, heading out mm-hmm. into the election, which is good to see. Okay, Ed, sticking with you though, what more could be done? What did you look from this that you're like, they're not losers, you want to be clear here, they're not losers, all right? They're just what more could be done out of this budget? What do you think, Ed? Yeah, look, every budget there's, uh, you know, the do more on this um, and that. It's which is which is kind of fair enough to an extent, but also no government, no budget can solve every problem at once. So that's a sort of the the, the caveat there. I mean, one of the, the the first things that people do raise alarm bells about in these budgets, particularly with labor budgets, is the rate of job seeker and income support <clears throat> that has not marginally shifted in this budget necessarily, though the government has been looking at at improving that over the past couple of years since they've been been in office. So there's that. Um, there was an increase as well in Commonwealth rent assistance of 10%, um, which is not nothing, but it's also not, you know, gargantuan either. Um, I think it ends up being $9 a week or something like that, which is, you know, it, 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 it's of course something, but it doesn't solve every problem. So I think some of the loudest criticisms that we've heard about, okay, who, who are missing out from, from this? Uh, certainly at that, uh, you know, in terms of, yeah, basically job seekers, those that are relying on Commonwealth rent assistance, maybe are not receiving this, the support that, that they should. But that being said, there are still other aspects of this budget that, that do assist them. You know, the um, energy support, energy subsidies, of course, are, are universal. Um, and that's potentially another, another controversy as well. The fact that that hasn't been means tested, we can maybe talk a little bit about the, the, the rationale behind that. They're, they're for me, really, the... the, the um, yeah, the the two probably most obvious uh, areas where there's potentially more more ambition that could be applied in the future. Um, Emma, I don't know if you want to yeah. add to that. Yeah, look, I think uh, it's important to acknowledge this and to talk about what is and isn't in isn't in the budget because um, the welfare lobby has been particularly vocal as as they should be. That's their job. Um, about the lack of a base of increase to the base rate of job seeker this time around. There was, of course, a forty forty dollar a fortnight increase last budget. And there was a forty dollar a fortnight, uh, fifty dollar a fortnight increase in uh, under the last budget of the last uh, Liberal government too, um, but it's still well below any any measure of the poverty line. Um, but what they have done, there is a uh, a small change. It'll only affect about five thousand people out of the million on the payment. That uh, if you're assessed as partial capacity to work only up to fourteen hours a week, you move to the higher rate of job seeker, uh, like people over fifty five. Um, it's a bit of a weird anomaly. Usually if you can't work up uh, more than 14 hours a week, you'd qualify for disability support pension, but there are a, a small group of people that are caught on other eligibility criteria, so it's a small loophole they fixed. Um, it, like I said, it doesn't affect a lot of people. But one of the things that has happened that, that a lot of people haven't really um, given enough notice to, in my view, um, is that they have changed um, some of the requirements for job seekers and their mutual obligations. So one of the big uh, criticisms of that program, of course, is that people get cut off their payment all the time if they miss an appointment, they, there's not enough flexibility. So they've expanded that window from 48 hours to five days if you miss an appointment before you automatic if and you don't respond to your provider before you get cut off and they've also um, said people could be working up to 30 hours a week they won't be cut off you know a lot of people miss an appointment because they're at, a, at work which is nonsense so they're they're making some early changes to that system and I expect them to respond more fully to the review of employment services uh, that was undertaken by Julian Hill there are good intentions there you know but we at some point um, we have to accept that this is a Labor Party and that their response to people on welfare is always going to start with how do we get them into work? How do we help them get into work? And that's very different from saying get a job, you loser, right? It's it's mm-hmm. not a get a job mentality. It's saying there are real barriers here and, and we recognise that a lot of people need a lot more support to participate in the economy. But we believe as a Labor Party that if they can, they should. 
for their own well-being and for the good of society. That is a different view to some people who would go as far as to say, no, we should just have a universal basic income and you should leave us alone to do whatever the hell we want. That is never going to be a position a Labourist government is going to take. And at some point, people need to accept that and start working with the government they've got, not the government they want, which is a Greens government, right? Um, So... There are things that can be done and that will be done and that are being done to better support people that are marginalised by our economic system. And I would argue the focus should be on, um, in future, on uh, lifting those barriers to accessing disability support payment. If you can't work more than 14 hours a week, you should be on DSP and you should be on an adequate payment that recognises you make a contribution in other ways and you can't work the way some other people can. Um, move the, the shift last year for single parents was very good. It recognised that the parents of young children can't be out of the house as much <laughs> as, as people without. Um, so a more nuanced approach Um, is what this government's taking. Um, They've also invested in this budget in a program to work with social enterprises in the regions to help people that are long-term unemployed to understand their barriers, to give them work experience at real rates of pay, award rates rates of pay. That's a different thing than work for the doll. So there are differences in the way this government's approaching it. It's not just screw you all, we don't care. It's not right to say they don't care. It is complex and I feel desperately for people that are trapped in poverty and don't see a way out and all they need right now is more money, right? I get that. Um, But governments have to make these very difficult choices all the time. That sounds like a defence of leaving people in poverty. It isn't. What I'm saying is to be strategic here. I think organisations like ACOS and anti-poverty organisations need to think differently about how they engage with a Labor government than how they engage with a Conservative government that just sees them as residualised mm. and not nothing to worry about, right? It's, it's a different mm. approach. Sorry, there rant, are... rant over. No, Emma, thank you so much. Um, and now that we've covered off the things that we like about it and the things that we could do more, uh, I actually want to pose two questions that um, we discussed in last week's preview episode. And the first one really is who did we who do we think this budget was going to be for? So, Ed, I want to go to you first and then I want to talk, Emma, a bit more about this threading the needle of the interest rates and um, and uh, the election and stuff. But let's talk about who do we think this budget is for. And you framed it up quite well before about these sort of core grid issues where they spoke about, but I just want to get you to unpack that a bit more. Who exactly is this targeting? The, the tricky thing they had going into this was they needed, you know, to be able to demonstrate empathy to kind of everyone that from, you know, up and down the income band, whether you're in, you know, like a middle income household in Sydney or out in the regions or whatever, that we were going through this genuine cost of living crunch that people's lives are getting harder and to be quite quite overt about that and to say hey we understand what 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 you're feeling and you know <laughs> there's been i think a, i think there was a fair bit of commentary about this in the day or two after the budget around you know backbenchers in in, lay, in the labor party others they, they need something to go and speak to people about on the huskings and they need a sort of simple clear idea um, that when they're door knocking, doesn't matter what whether people are earning forty thousand dollars a year or one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. Uh, what is the government doing for you? Well, we're doing this. Um, uh, obviously, there's the stage three tax cuts change, which we talked about last week. Which anyone who's got a job will be, you know, better off uh, to, to varying degrees. But that that is a pretty significant thing to be able to go and communicate to people. And then the new measure in this, the sort of marquee initiative, really was the three hundred dollar. Um, energy subsidy, which applies universally to every single household. And there's a few rationales behind that. Um, one was that it's by, by making it universal, it achieves the intended aim really of reducing that measure of CPI on, the, on, on energy prices in a, in a consistent way. Um, but it also speaks to literally every single household in the country and says, hey, this is something that we've materially done that you're materially going to see and be better off for. So, you know, there's that. Um, so there is something in the budget literally for everyone who's effectively, you know, paying tax in the country. So that's a, that's a helpful position to be in going into a, to an election. Um, but then there are, you know, genuine, uh, things in the now around housing, you know, they have looked at, um, you know, expanding considerably certain, certain investments in social housing and things like that, but also 
with the Future Made in Australia agenda, demonstrating that, hey, we, we understand the pressures that people are feeling today. We understand the sort of immediacy of the, the, the problem and that you need government to help solve those problems now. But we also need to steer us in a certain direction, um, recognise the world is changing. We're in a position to sort of navigate that change and, and we've got an eye on the future too. So um, it wasn't uh, some of the, I think it was a, Ross Giddens perhaps wrote an article saying that the, the budget doesn't solve any one problem fully it kind of spread across you know and and solved everyone's problems a little bit and there's probably a bit of bit of truth in that but it wasn't necessarily a, a budget targeted to, to you know one demographic one core group one constituency to get over the line it is trying to you know own that middle australia um sort of uh, space emma last week we were umming and ahhing about is this budget going to um, provide relief to families um, with and use some of that surplus um, to address the cost of living, but at the same time that wouldn't maybe become inflationary, therefore the Reserve Bank probably wouldn't bring down interest rates with eyes on the election basically. Mm. Um, so we were sort of like, oh, what do they do here? What, what, what did they do in the end? What, what, what is the outcome? And I want to get your thoughts on um, does this set Labor up for an early election or do you think it's still going to be in the early part of 2025? So they have uh, – the measures that they've taken to support households are very carefully designed to be non-inflationary, to be deflationary actually. So if you look, they've, they've done – uh, um, they've repeated what they did last year in many ways. So they, uh, to energy bill relief last year, which was a direct rebate on your energy bills, and the 15% lift in Commonwealth rent assistance last year, both those things were assessed as deflationary because in the consumer price index, the basket of goods we measure, um, rent <laughs> and energy bills are two big items. If the cost of those comes down for the household, then that reduces headline inflation. Now, it's a bit tricky, right, because it's not actually bringing the price of them down. It's it's offsetting the price through government intervention. So people will say, well, is that really bringing inflation down? But the point here is it's the CPI, it's the headline inflation rate that the Reserve Bank looks at when it decides whether to move on interest rates. So if the headline inflation rates come down, that helps them either not lift or to cut interest rates. So that's what they've got their eye on here. They are desperately trying not to pull in an opposite direction to the RBA. What they don't want to see is a, another rate rise before the election um, because a third of households are very, very exposed to those mortgage rate interest rate rises, and that's middle Australia. There are a lot of very highly leveraged people um, in you know lower and lower middle income brackets in the outer suburbs, in the regions, who are very sensitive to another interest rate rise. So the the trick was to provide support to households in a way that wouldn't trigger more inflation, more inflationary pressure. And these two uh, mechanisms have been shown to do that. Um, so it was carefully designed in that way. I think they'll be keeping a very close eye on inflation. It has come down. You know, we've, it's got a three in front of it now. We'd like it to have a two in front of it. Between 2.5 and three is what the Reserve Bank's going for. Um, money, there are people that go, it doesn't matter, monetary policy, nah, nah. These, this is Again, this is the reality we live in. Um, <laughs> this is the economic system we currently have and the government has to operate in it. So um, I think that was smart. Um the surplus, again, there's a lot of people saying, how can we, why would we run a $9.6 billion surplus? You could spend $4 billion of that and lift JobSeeker, right, to, to below, above the Henderson poverty line. Yeah, but they have to, that, to keep that $4 billion going year on year and we're in deficit next year. It's also arguable that that would be, I don't, look, would it be inflationary this year? Probably not, uh, not, not, not to the extent that um, some people say it would. But the theories are there, right, that for every you know, billion dollars you put into the economy, that's a point something of a, of a percent possible interest rate wise. Mm. Um, so they have to thread that needle and they have to be aware that at a time the simple the simple economic mass tells us if you've got a hot economy, which we have, uh, you put more money into it, you make it hotter. The only justifiable time to run a surplus is when we're in an inflationary crisis. When when the economy's slow, then, yeah, you pump more money into it, right? Um, but when it's hot, you have to show some restraint. So that surplus was um, – there's a lot of theatre around surpluses in this country. 
Uh, they funnily seem to be less important to the right-wing press than they once were. Uh, now there's a Labor government, funnily enough. Um, but there is good reason to run a surplus during a time of inflation. So they've got very much an eye on not just the electoral cycle but on the economic cycle and on what their decisions might mean for households that are under pressure. Um I don't necessarily mean think that means they're going to go early. I think you know if if there's it depends very much what happens between now and Christmas um, to the inflation rate, how the Reserve Bank reacts to that. Uh, you know if there's an interest rate rise in the second half of the year, they'll they'll wait it out as long as possible to try and get that back down again. But the indications are that the economy's you know that we're coming in for what you call a soft landing, hopefully. So that's what they'll be hoping and. Um, I think on all measures, you can say it's not bold enough, it's too bold in some areas, people will have their criticisms, um, but it's a very tricky time to land a budget like this. They do have to have an eye on, you know, if they, if they want to do the kinds of economic reform that, let's be honest, they haven't done yet, the kind of tax reform that everyone thinks they need to do, then they need another couple of terms in government to bed that in. And so it is important to think about who's going to be in the chair next time, because, we can introduce all of this investment in the economy um, to drive the shift to renewables. Dutton's already said he'll can all that. He won't support it. So do we want investment in our future or not? You know, so it's, it's important to, to keep an eye on how you, how you stay in government and do the things you want to do. Ed, do you think that this budget is setting ourselves up for an early election or do you still think that, that the, um, the elbow will run the full term? Well, the conventional wisdom, I think, is that it, it creates the space to do so if necessary. There's sort of enough in there to, to run on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I feel like we've got into a pretty consistent rhythm with these May elections. It kind of works. You, you end up having an early, an early budget in March um, and then it sort of kicks off the cycle. The only tricky thing is when you look at the budget on some of these these things that are very good politically like the surplus and we can talk about and, and you're right there's the, the theatrics around surpluses but people kind of like it and it looks like you're kind of in control of things um there's pretty hefty deficit sort of in forecast for years and years ahead so the risk is if they did another budget you know just before the next election does that paint worse news the unemployment rate like some of the forecasts in the budget were pretty interesting so Yes, it forecast inflation was going to come down well within that um, the RBA sort of target band, but it did also forecast a pretty sharp rise in unemployment. Nothing catastrophic, but to to that sort of four and a half percent level, which is you know pretty pretty discernible. I think we're at three point nine percent now. So some of the you know some of the those key measures in a year's time will look a bit worse than in this budget. So if they do want to go to an early election, then they're, they're equipped to do so. Um, I mean, my only, I mean, I, I would agree, I think that's unlikely, but, you know, I think this does set up a very healthy and a very kind of exciting uh, and tempting contrast with the opposition. Um, you know, they want to spend public money on, on nuclear. They want to make sure that people <laughs> don't get paid when they, could, you know, work from home and all this sort of stuff. This, the, the stuff they've been putting out there is kind of pretty radical and not, not actually particularly coherent. So it feels like the government has a, has a good story to tell and a bit of a narrative arc to what they're doing and has sort of got the wind behind its back with a lot of the data here and the opposition sort of feels like it's scrambling them a little bit. So I, I'm actually very curious to see what, what Dutton does announce as in tonight's budget reply. We haven't really talked much about the budget reply, um, but this could potentially be his last budget reply before... He before gets rolled. Yeah. <laughs> or before he gets rolled or, or before an election. So, um, yeah, look, I, I don't think there will be an early election, but... but um, it's it's not impossible either. Uh, I always forget about the budget reply. Maybe we can talk about that at the end for some comic relief. Um, let's dive into some of the things. We've been promising for 30 minutes that we're going to sort of unpack some of the stuff. Emma, I want to go to you first of all, the housing, yeah. what movement on housing. Just give us the top line uh, cliff notes on that and what do you think that means? Um, there's big money for housing. Um, the, the, the allegation, the accusation from Max Chandler Mather that this government doesn't care has been, you know, I would say comprehensively refuted by this budget. There is an entire budget paper 
devoted to housing. Um, this is like from a policy nerd point of view, that's a big win, right? We, we put out a report in January saying this is what the government spends and we've had to look in five different portfolios to find it all and there should be a statement and it, it's a principal budget paper. You know, it's one of the four, one of the five um, major budget papers this year is meeting the housing challenge. Um, and there's about $32 billion of spending measures in there that have come in since this government came into power, including another 6.2 that's new in this budget. Now, the caveats up front, yeah, more direct spending on social housing is what's needed. And I would argue there's still not enough of that. Um, there's, you know, a lot of that money's going to social housing, um, but there's also, there is also a need for the private sector to do their part, right? And the government has to play a role in encouraging them to do so. Um, because sadly, um, many people now don't want to live in social housing. They think it's a horrible stigmatised thing. We need to change that, but that's going to take time. Um, but this, there are practical things in here, you know, really important practical measures. Um, the billion dollars that's provided to the states and territories for housing-related infrastructure, it's not much, but it's important. And, you know, um, quite opposed to what Max Chandler Mather said, it is money for housing. You ask any urban planner if you can build housing without roads and sewers and they'll laugh in your face, Max. So it is money for housing. Um, there is, there's also really important recognition of the capacity constraints that we have. So there's 20,000 free TAFE places for construction workers and there's a relaxation of the immigration rules for qualified, for adequately qualified construction workers to come in from overseas to get construction moving on the homes they want to build. Um, that this is, this is it, it may not be, you know, a, a big splashy announcement of a public developer that when you look at the detail absolutely will not work, uh, thanks Greens. This is what actually needs to be done, right? It's the hard work of looking where the constraints are and the very many complex issues. It's a wicked problem, housing affordability, um, working with the states, making the right investments, clearing roadblocks, addressing planning issues, recognising that, yes, it's about supply, um, and this is more money than we have seen go into housing from a federal government in more than 30 years. So to suggest that this government doesn't get and doesn't care about the housing crisis is wrong. If anything, it's the government that understands how incredibly complex it is and that it takes a long time to turn around 30 years of willfully abrogating the state's role in providing shelter to the market and saying we're going to we're going to take some back, back some of that responsibility um the the thing missing that everyone goes oh they haven't touched negative gearing and capital gains tax no and nor should they absent broader tax reform. They absolutely need to tackle those issues. But you just do it in isolation and you cause a whole heap of other problems in the tax system, as we all know. And you upend a lot of people's plans for their retirement. You upend um, a lot of investment decisions that have been made by relatively, you know, highly leveraged average households. So it needs to be done. I We will continue to advocate for it needs to be done in a way that is part of a significant review of our entire tax take. And I, I believe there is still an appetite to do that within the party, um, but I think they were right not to jump at shadows and just make changes arbitrarily without consultation, without, um, you know, announcing to the country they're going to do that and have it as part of a, a bigger approach to tax reform. So this is a government that gets the housing crisis um, and that wants to do something about it. There are definitely, I would like to see much more spending directly on building public and community housing today, but there's a hell of a lot more there than there was when this government came to power. So I think um, the housing sector is a, is a winner out of this. And if you look at the people that are experts in housing, they'll pretty much say the same thing I did. We should have more social housing, but what is being done here is important. There's a lot of support for the community housing sector there's investment loans to the sector. There's investments in upgrade and um, and, and the maintenance of homes. Um, and there's a cooperative approach. There's better, there's a you know renters' rights approach as well that's been agreed with the states and territories. Um, and they're the ones that have constitutional responsibility. So it's not easy, but it's being it's being taken seriously. It certainly seems like I mean there's a lot of stuff in that particular area, um, and I, I personally think that the training more tradies that the, the twenty thousand free TAFE places um, for folks working in housing and construction is great. Um, it's been a very popular piece of 
public policy in the Victorian Andrews uh, slash uh, Allen government um, when they brought in free TAFE. And I think it's great to see that that's going to be uh, applied right across the country. Ed, do you have any other reflections on housing? Otherwise, I'll jump to uh, climate and renewables for you. Yeah, no, not, not, I think Emma really comprehensively discussed that. I, I agree, though, generally with that, that sentiment that, you know, in social housing, there's such an extraordinary need <laughs> like it's a such a such a so it's a we can't solve that problem in one budget of course but but that's something that you're going to see that pressure remain in future years so so that's um that's pretty clear but the fact that it's so central well, part of what i've been talking about over the last couple of months is that um the government on housing have been doing a lot but not necessarily fully demonstrating the empathy as much as they could at times and i think this is a helpful structure to demonstrate that yes they get it but also they're practically doing a lot of things so so that's helpful um so on the on the climate renewable stuff and you know really future made in 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 australia stuff too we already talked a little bit about this but i mean there's there's a huge amount in there um uh <laughs> i was just looking through every every line item i mean this is a sort of what 30 something billion dollar 23 billion dollar i think package um of commitments over the over the next few years what what's happening at the moment? I mean, uh, what, what two years ago the Biden administration passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is you know sort of humorously named, but is primarily just this this enormous industrial investment in the new economy and the new industrial capacity of the United States to tackle um, to, to tackle a whole bunch of uh, uh, you know new manufacturing opportunities, etc., and to really compete with China's dominance in those spaces. When we look at things like solar panel manufacturing you know, electric vehicle manufacturing, batteries, all that sort of stuff. That is all, you know, really being dominated by the Chinese economy. The US really said, you know, hey, we, wanna, um, we want to uh, correct that. And you actually saw this week the Biden administration put a whole bunch of more tariffs on Chinese imports of those types of technologies. Now, the Australian government can't spend nearly as much, uh, even in sort of a percentage of GDP terms, as um, the US is doing on the IRA. But this is sort of Australia's answer to that to an extent. It's, um, you know, recognising that uh, Australia has a whole bunch of competitive advantages it could potentially uh, pursue. Like, you know, we do have this wealth of abundant clean energy and there's in the sort of new green steel industries and all that sort of stuff we're going to need to capitalize on that um but uh we've also kind of lost a lot of the value of um you know the sort of downstream value adding opportunities that we've had in our that we could potentially get if we use more of our resources to manufacture stuff actually in australia and that's sort of part of the context of what they've been doing so the, the package, and I think Emma, Emma talked about some of the details here uh, probably more eloquently than I did, you know, probably more across it specifically. But the broader, the broader thinking is, you know, this is where the country needs to head. The headline number is sort of $23.6 billion, whatever it is. But that's designed not just to be the total package. It's to stimulate greater private sector investment in those spaces. And there's a huge amount in there. There's a, there's a few sort of, you know, picking winners type projects as people criticize it. There's a thing called this, um, what's it, the solar initiative battery initiative sure. there's a big tax credit for critical mineral minerals um, sort of value adding but then there is a lot around um, skills development as well so there's a lot of investment in, in skills and training so this will be a theme of the government you know going forward for, for years um but emma i'm not sure if you wanted to add anything on that no look just that i i think it absolutely is the centerpiece of their um of their industrial agenda and their economic approach um, Albanese's, you know, he's across this stuff. He he knows um, the challenges of our very, you know, deep deep lack of econ of economic complexity, of industrial complexity. That whether uh, some folk like it or not, at at some point in our children's lifetimes, we will stop exporting so much coal and gas because the market, the world market, is in decline and has to be to save the planet. And we need to replace those industries with what happens next. And uh, sneaky push for my book of the same title in 2020. But, you know, that, that, that set out a lot of this agenda and Albanese contributed to it. So did Chalmers. Um, mm. uh, and it, it really is about saying 
you know, after the after the Second World War, um, and we'd, we'd come through poly crises then in the first half of the 20th century, two world wars, massive depression, uh, Spanish flu, you know, it sounds familiar really. We don't have those kind of, you know, massive wars, <laughs> although Dutch would anymore, but the crisis issue is the same. We have to restructure the economy. It's the same scale of challenge, right? And governments have to do it. Um, they have to do it to ensure that people aren't, don't become, you know, collateral damage in that shift and that we we play to our strengths, that we invest where we're going to see the greatest return, that we look at what our natural resources are and take advantage of them. Um, it is a bold, positive agenda uh, and most Australians will be on board with it. Most Australians are very cynical about the idea that, that government shouldn't have a role in that. We should just let big corporations decide where they can extract the most value and where they can make the most profit, you know. Um, it is not just a redistributive agenda, it's a pre-distributive agenda to sort of say, you know, how do we build good, strong communities based around good new industries and this idea too that some have that, well, if you lose your job in a primary industry as a miner, you can always get a job in hospo or tourism. Very hard to, you know, to build a family around that. Um, not that those jobs aren't important but they're underpaid and they're undervalued and that needs fixing too but that's going to take time. Um, in, the, in the meantime, if you want to convince a mining engineer on 180 grand that he's going to have a future as a barista and his family's going to be okay, he's going to laugh in your face. So that's not pandering to grievance. That's recognising the responsible role of creating a future for people. So I'll, I could bang on all day, but that, I, I just think it's the obvious thing that needs to be done. Thank God they're doing it. Can we talk about it more, please? <laughs> Emma, sticking with you, um, the uh, we had a number of protests across the streets of our capital cities uh, a couple of weeks ago, calling on the government to do more in response to gender-based violence. Um, let's talk about this budget and uh, did it uh, address some of those issues or, and uh, what exactly have they uh, put money behind? Because there's been a n- number of announcements in this, re- in this respect as well. There have and there's there's disappointment from the sector that it's not enough, you know. Um, so to step back and take the, the gender lens more broadly than just than just violence against women, not just, um, but these things are all interrelated. It is a very, um, it's a responsible budget in that regard. There's 140-something references to women, gender and equality in this budget. There were three in Josh Frydenberg's last budget, you know. Um, There's a women's budget statement again. There's investment in wages for aged care workers and early childhood educators who are 85 90% women. Um, there's the extension of superannuation on paid parental leave, the government's paid parental leave scheme. Um, this government takes the care economy and women's economic security seriously. Um, funding for frontline services, we probably should have seen more um, in response to the the spike in violence against women. Um, and those organisations <clears throat> do incredibly important work and they are underfunded and they're often staffed by volunteers. So anything more we can do in that space we should be doing, um, just quite simply because we need that that front those frontline services. But again, in the housing package, there's a discrete billion dollars set aside for emergency housing and specifically housing for women and children fleeing domestic violence. Um, there is... You know, there are a number of things that are being invested in in small ways that add up to quite a lot. But the challenge here is um, exactly what what a federal government can do about this. Uh, in, a, in a short term or in an immediate term, um, those crisis services are incredibly important. But longer term, it's a shift, it's a cultural shift that we need to see. Um, and what are the causes of systemic male violence, uh, which is predominantly against women. Um, And I know, again, people sort of roll their eyes at this sometimes, but I think uh, uh, the idea that that violence just springs entirely from misogyny and that men hit women because they hate them um, is not, there might be some truth to to parts of it, but it's not a a terribly helpful way to approach the problem. violence and and a lot of it springs from despair right shame humiliation the feeling that you're not that you're not valuable that you've got nothing to offer um and that's that goes to this rise in young men becoming more conservative and more reactionary while women are becoming more progressive um it's a loss of hope it's a loss of opportunity for a lot of young men it's a loss of feeling that they have a place 
in the new world order, in the new economy. They're told they're not important all the time. We don't need you to have kids. We can we can work. We can do it all ourselves. There is a there is a link, whether people find it tenuous or not, between building that kind of economy where there's opportunity and hope for young people and reducing levels of, of violence. It won't, it's not the only answer, but it's part of the answer. And there is no one thing that will ever eliminate entirely male violence from our society because we're animals and it will all there'll always be a propensity for people to become violent when they're angry and when they're upset. It's about how we respond to that as a community. So, yeah, I would have liked to see more investment in frontline services, um, but I think the bigger issue is one that uh, the despair and the anger and the desperation of women to go, just someone do something, right, just do something. I feel it too. I'm terrified. I've got a daughter. I just don't, you know, what, what the world is is scary sometimes. But we also have to recognise that there are limits on what what governments can do in this space it's a community-wide problem um the funding needs to be there to support communities to address it uh so i'm feeling pretty negative about the whole violence against women issue to be honest with you but generally from a gender point of view is this government you know taking seriously what what women's policy experts have told them for years yes they are they're applying a gender lens to the budget they're investing in women's workforce participation they're investing in um, the care economy and lifting wages of those jobs they're um, investing in women's economic security Uh, but of course there's always more that needs to be done. Uh, Ed we Uh, I know we touched on some cost of living things before, but I just want to get your thoughts on wrapping up anything else in terms of, you mentioned the sort of the means tested uh, energy subsidy, but other measures in the budget that are addressing the cost of living that you just want to reflect on? Well, really the core ones were those, the the major tax cuts for everyone. um, And then that energy subsidy that we did mention there were of course, some of that support around Commonwealth rent assistance, Things that are kind of more tenuous, you know, the prac placements for for those that are kind of have to deal with poverty going through training, that is really important as well. And it does help a lot of people, though there are, you know, legitimate, uh, you know, arguments and criticism around some of these aspects. And I think one of the, you know, the immediate pushback on the energy subsidy was, of course, you know, why on earth be (laughs) taking $300 off, uh, you know, people earning half a million bucks a year off their power bill and, uh, and doing the same for those lower down the uh, uh, the income spectrum, there's an answer to that, and I think um, you know the, the government are happy to prosecute that. But that'll be a legitimate question going forward as well. Like why why have you allocated resources so broadly when there's just such acute pressures for those that are doing it really really difficult? So that's going to be something that they're going to have to continue to to, to answer. Um, yeah. And last area of. Uh... Uh, focus emma health talk to us about some of the major things that were announced in this budget in yeah, regards to health um, and I'm, I'm not as across the detail of this as as some of the other areas like housing and things that we work on directly um but you know this this is a this is a labor government there's an investment there in in lifting um in lifting what we're spending on health um and i think in combination with the states uh you know a desire to kind of uh, get more money into the hospital system uh, in particular, um, increasing bulk billing incentives is really important. Um, it probably doesn't go far enough, though. We're going to need a big investment in Medicare next time around, and particularly in those primary cares, because uh, you know people are finding it harder and harder to access bulk billing doctors. Um, but there's at least you know some investment there, a recognition that it's a problem, um, and the digital health pro- the digital health platform is really good, of course, and renewing that commitment to having a, an Australian Centre for Disease Control, despite those that go, oh, the pandemic's over now, there'll be there'll be other pandemics, right? It's <laughs> we're, we're entering an age of significant concern around disease control and I, I read a terrifying article about, you know, the, the lack of a, the declining efficacy of, of antibiotics uh, in, around the world. So CDC is important. Um, freezing the price of, of medicines for five years, so, you know, pensioners and health car, car, health card holders, healthcare card holders, I can never say that, um, will see their, their medicines stay at $7.70 for five years. That's a really important change. Um, people that have chronic health conditions and the, the older you get, the more likely you are to have multiple chronic health conditions can spend a lot of money 
on medication a lot and it's a, and you know if only seven dollars seventy per prescript per script out of pocket but you some people have five ten scripts a month right my late yeah. husband had 13 by the time he died yeah. um so that's, that's up a big invest- but, really God, can I just jump in on that? So I said at the start, I was I watched the budget with my old man just at his seventieth, yeah. as well a few weeks ago. But he um, <laughs> he is on the NDIS. He's uh, had you know a range of health problems over the last ten years, and when that was announced, I mean, it, it he you know he was very had a very visceral reaction. I mean, it's really really meaningful to people, um, and and yeah, sometimes the the cheaper medicine stuff is probably a little bit down in what we're talking about but it's just so practical and so you know material in people's lives and um and yeah a lot of people if you've got one chronic health condition it's not on the script it's it's four five ten you know makes a difference yeah and it's not just your nan and pop either is it i mean it really impacts a lot of people in the community even Absolutely. younger people um yep. so it yeah i mean you know people so, yeah. there there are there are a heap of chronic health conditions that we now very fortunately live with things that used to kill us a hundred years ago right that are quite rise, widespread in the community um hypertension and um type 2 diabetes and you know a whole range of conditions that require ongoing medication so no it's a big one it actually really does affect people's hip pockets but to your point i mean maybe this is a whole nother podcast maybe you should get the minister for health on but i mean i've you know emmy in the last shot you were talking about we need to have a big conversation about tax structural tax reform about how we you know, tax our citizens. I think there needs to be kind of a question about our health system as well and the relationship between the federal government and the states. Mm -hmm. Uh, COVID really, really kind of put our health system through the ringer and exposed some glaring uh, gaps, but also showed that it held up broadly as well. So there's, I'm not saying just throw the whole thing out, but there kind of needs to be a bit of a nationwide review about our health system. How do we get it to work for our citizens? Because you kind of look at, you know, the United States is an absolute shit show. The National Health Service in the UK is in real problem. Like, you know, it used to be held up as the gold standard, right? And uh, and I don't think that we should in Australia think we can just sort of skirt through and think that we're going to be okay on this one. I, you know, I think this, there, needs to be a, there needs to be a conversation about that um, as well. All right, let's do some wrap-ups. Um, final thoughts, final reflections, something odd you want to share um, that came out of it before we get out of here. The one I want to lift up is... Vol- uh, compulsory student unionism didn't see that coming back and as a former student hack uh, you know <laughs> if it wasn't for student unionism i wouldn't be here today so i you know i feel in some way i feel a bit mixed about it because we lost that fight and then i, I didn't even know that we were arguing for to get that brought back so i'm kind of a bit like oh, is that what we want to do okay sure so you know a lot of student hacks around the country going you ripper <laughs> back in the game baby <laughs> anyway so i thought that was quite interesting that um <laughs> I did. I, I, uh, you know, I lasted literally ten minutes at my first student politics meeting, and then I turned around and walked out, and never went back. I probably would have had a very different career if it weren't for, for that experience. I know. I mean, the upside is it's great for students, but at the same, the downside is a whole bunch of trots going. Oh, I'm relevant again. Um, so I just don't know how I feel about that. Um, that's my reflections. Uh, Ed, I'll go to you, and then we'll get uh, Emma you to wrap up for the last. Point, Ed, your reflection from this I, 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 I was going to mention that because yeah, I think everyone's sort of like what. Okay, like I don't I don't know who worked on that, but that, that yeah. Anyway, that was interesting. Um, the only other one little thing I, I I'd flag. Um, we did a little budget submission beforehand. We had a had a bunch of just kind of smaller ideas, but one of them was around non compete clauses and reforming non compete clauses. Mm-hmm. And the government has signaled they're doing a lot on that, but they did put money into their the doing a competition review review, and they you know have allocated more resources to specifically look at reforming non competes. That will significantly address, I think, the you know wages. Like it's a really absurd aspect of our labor market that we have so many workers on like lower incomes, even Uber drivers, restricted by what are non-binding and kind of quasi illegal at times uh, uh, non-compete clauses. But nevertheless, people feel obliged to to comply with them. So there will be reform in that space in the next six months. I think that's another thing that's going to unlock some of the some of the wages uh, opportunities for people. Fantastic, good job, Mikel. Uh and to you, Emma. Final reflection. Um, my final reflection is going to build on yours, Stephen. It's not just our health system that needs a, a you know, root, root and branch review. Um, our education system, I mean, arguably the University Accords doing that, but school education as well. Um, our entire system of, of you know, employment services, 
Um, I would argue all of our social assistance and care programs, they're all chronically underfunded and falling over around the world. Um, so the the conversation we need to have about tax is also about transfers. It's about the entire um, system of public services and essential services. We can't keep patching up a system that's falling over because of 40, 50 years of deliberate neglect and underinvestment and outsourcing to the market. Um, we have to re claim our common wealth. And that means a huge conversation about what kind of country you want to be. Um, how do we fund that? How do we, uh, what, what's the appropriate contribution for different parts of society to make to the appropriate outcome that is in the best interests of all of us? Um, that's the kind of big conversation that Murdoch and his friends do not want us to have and have been preventing us from having. And the left, frankly, I've said this many times, has been far too willing to go, okay, don't hurt us, we'll just, we'll just do technocratic changes over here. here. It is time to sell. It is time to sell that vision and to say, look, this, this is not working for far too many people, right? Everyone's under pressure. You can't get a doctor's appointment. If you get one, you can't get bulk billing. Your kids are sick. You can't afford the medicine. Your school fees are going up. Even in public schools, you're paying more and more for what used to be, you know, automatic inclusions. You can't get a job with sick leave and annual leave until you're in your 30s. And then when you do, you can't afford to buy a house. What is the purpose of that? You know, so that's the big conversation. Um, it's still a scary conversation to have, but if all, if we don't have it through forums like this, we're not going to have it anywhere. And I think what you can see in this budget and in this government's agenda is an awareness of that. Um, the, a lot of the pieces of the puzzle are in there. And at some point, we as a nation need to start engaging with that conversation and giving our elected representatives, the space and the trust to make the changes that we need to have made. Because uh, if we keep going the way we're going, you know, it's going to be another two, three terms of Labor, then the coalition government comes in and undoes it all. And we see this happening all over the world. We, it's time for systemic root and branch reform of our society and our economy. And that's, the, that's what I see as a second and third term agenda for a good social democratic government. It's a very good point to end on um, because those, as we've seen in certainly in Europe, those folks that fall through the cracks um, lose faith in government and lose faith in sort of the centrality of our democracy and that leads to them getting sort of dabbling with, you know, right-wing fringe groups and international communism and that's what we don't want. Um, that's why we're a social democratic uh, party. We want everyone to be in our big tent. Um, thank you so much uh, to Ed Kavanagh from the McCall Institute. Good luck with the rest of the year. Ed, thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure. And Emma Dawson from Per Capita, as usual. Thank you so much. Uh, keep punching, doing great work, uh, both of you in the space of uh, public policy. Thanks. Um, and uh, thanks for being on this journey for these two podcasts over the budget. Um, great to talk to you both, and we'll um, no doubt talk to you in the future. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And to get all the latest on Socially Democratic, follow Dunstreet on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.